Engagers, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights and inspiration to help us in the process of using games and gamification in our daily lives, for example, to learn what we are teaching. And I am Rob Alvarez. I work at Ironhack, teach at IE Business School University and so much more and host this podcast. If you have an extra second, please go ahead and subscribe for free to our email list at professorgame.com slash subscribe. Engagers, welcome back to another episode of the Professor Game podcast. And today we have Thais with us. But Thais, are you prepared to engage? I am, absolutely. <laughs> Let's do this because Thais is today with us because he is an expert in using gaming techniques for learning and changing behavior. And as an international speaker, he talks to business leaders and managers worldwide about the impact of playful learning. In 2017, he also founded his latest startup venture, which is called Warp VR, which is a company that revolutionizes how people train by combining learning, gaming, and virtual reality. So, Thais, I don't know if there's anything that I'm missing from that intro, if I said your name decently, or at least understandably for, for you, or not, <laughs> or if there's anything else you want to add as well. No, absolutely. You did it perfect. So, uh, name is all good. That's fantastic, then. So, Thais, is there anything else you want to mention about the company? I don't know what you're doing currently before we, we take off. Uh, yeah, of course. I can explain a little bit about the company, what we're currently doing. So as you already said, uh, I founded this uh, company together with two other co-founders in 2017. It was actually coming from my work as a gamification consultant, which I did for a couple of years uh, and advised and helped startups, but as well as, as bigger corporates in using game thinking and game-based solutions for uh, you know some of their problems. Uh, could be um, teaching employees but certain procedures, but also activating consumers but to, to be using you know, products more and more. Um, but mainly in that area of training and learning, also kind of changing behavior, I noticed we could do a little bit more. So I came in touch with VR as a technology, found it hugely interesting. And together with my co-founders, we did some uh, experiments, seeing what we could do combining VR technology and game-based learning. And that was, you know, so interesting. We did a couple of projects for some different clients <laughs> and they were all like, okay, this is amazing. You know, we need to invest more, more time, more resources into this uh, to, to see, you know, what we can do with this and, and how we can, you know, truly help our employees learn more, learn better. So that kind of convinced us to start this into a business. So that's Warp VR. And uh, with Warp VR, we are a SaaS uh, solution. We work uh, B2B. And we've got a platform that helps clients in uh, creating, but also distributing and analyzing you know, VR training scenarios. And we all do this with 360 video and storytelling, you know, which, uh, which is an important game mechanic we use. And uh, you know, clients can create these VR training scenarios and make sure the employees can play them on you know, smartphones, but also on standalone VR headsets. A lot of fun to do. So we're doing this for some really cool clients. And there, I also noticed that, you know, the whole, let's say, game-based aspect uh, really works when you combine it well with, in this case, training and, and, and VR as a technology. That's amazing, Thais. And we would like to know, because you, you've talked about the company, you've talked about, you know, meeting with all these clients and doing the, all these amazing things, but we would like to know more sort of a, a, on a more down-to-earth thing. Like, what are you doing regularly? What's, what's your life look like in a, in a day or in a week? Can you give us a little bit of insights into what Tice is doing regularly? Yes, absolutely. It's a, directly a, a bit of a difficult question, as in uh, <laughs> managing you know, a startup, being one of the founders, means uh, that there's a lot, lot of different things to do. So we're still a pretty young company, so, which you know, I guess means that, that you're still doing quite a bit. So it's you know, legal work, strategy, managing, sales, marketing. But I would say that, that the most fun I have is in designing, you know, so the so making sure that the products we have work good, you know, look good, uh, are easy to use. Uh, so we, we can, you know, uh, get as many employees of our clients using the product and making sure that they can play the VR training scenarios. But I also love really talking to clients and see how they're using our products and 
making sure that we can help them in the best way possible. And also there, you know, very often in, in the whole process of creating these, you know, we call them training scenarios. I love, you know, thinking with them on what the narrative could be, you know, and what, what the game-based aspect could be and where the, let's say, interesting dilemmas are in those training scenarios where it can get hard for employees to make choices. So that whole process is really interesting to do. Sounds very, very exciting. I, I, as you know, and the engagers know, I also come from the learning space and, you know, combining gamification, games, games-based learning and all these things in, you know, interesting dilemmas, interesting situations is always something that is very, very exciting. At least for me, maybe I'm just a geek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably I am as well, but it, definitely it is, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and Thais, we would like to get into sort of, you, you mentioned storytelling. And so we would like to get into story mode right now, because you've been in the space for quite a while, then you founded a company as well. And I'm sure you've had the very good times and you've mentioned, you know, how, how good things have, have been going as well. But you've also had some difficult times. So we would like to know if a, if a time where, you know, things didn't go your way, or what you would maybe like to call your favorite failure when creating one of these games or gamified solutions or game based solutions, whatever you want to go for, because we want to sort of be there with you and learn some of those lessons that you took out of that experience. Yes, good question. You know, I think in some way you fail every day, you know, being an entrepreneur, I, I think, you know, would equal failure at some point. I mean, you learn so much, but you learn because of failure. You know, every, every single failure is actually a learning moment. And I think, you know, that's that's why games are interesting because you do a lot of failure while you're playing games, right? There's a lot of frustration. So each time you just don't make that level, you fail, but you learn, you get up and, you know, you do it again until you succeed. Uh, so, and I think I, I, I have that in my work, you know, quite a bit. You know, eventually you're doing a lot of things. You don't know how to do them. You just try them. You know, sometimes you, you win directly. Sometimes you fail. But there's that one specific moment I think would be nice to share. Uh, which is, you know, from a long time ago. It's actually my graduation, which is, uh, you know, 10, 11, 12 years ago. And I can remember that when I did my graduation project, which was kind of a project I really didn't want to do, but I did anyway <laughs> because, I don't know, somebody uh, told me to do it. And I can remember that my professor at the time was telling me that in order to, you know, make people really enthusiastic about what you've done, you have to be, let's say, twice as enthusiastic yourself. And I wasn't about my graduation project, right? So I wasn't that, you know, uh, I, I wasn't really inspired on that project. So I couldn't really convey that message. You know, I, re I, re I couldn't, you know, inspire others because I wasn't inspired myself. So I really learned from that project, that whole process, that you can only inspire people if you're, if you're doing what you truly believe in. And for me, that's really important. So every day, if I do what I truly believe in, then it's really okay to fail, you know, then I know I can learn from it. And in that process, I can inspire others as well. So for me, that, that's kind of a, a key moment. At that time, I truly saw it as failure, but now I can take lessons from it. Makes sense. And if you were to face a similar situation in the near future, what would you do different? Like, how would you approach it maybe a little bit different to, you know, have a different either outcome or a different attitude? What would be some key things that you would do in a, again, in a different way? I think to fail, you know, often. So I think it would be good to, uh, so, so I think that, that that's what I'm currently doing is trying to get into a process where you're trying things, get them out there. And if they're not good, you know, then it's all fine. You can fail because, you know, if it fails, only a small part of it will fail then you can learn from it and you can do it over again and improve. So that's really something, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of you know, I don't know, some, some people call it startup mindset, but I think that's really what we're trying to do as well. It's what I'm trying to do is, although I don't know every single detail of, I don't know, could, could be even a contract, could be a, a workshop with a client, could be design aspects, uh, still really try to do it, be prepared for the fact that you could fail and think that it's okay to do so and then try to improve. Makes sense. <laughs> there you go. So that, that, that would be a, a different approach to fail. Sort of, I, I can't remember the exact phrase, but it's like fail 
often or something like that. Fail, fail often, right? It's that's exactly, a phrase. Yeah, yeah, a catchphrase. True, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. And and I think it's important for us to remember that. And we were talking in the pre-interview chat of how important it is for education as well, for kids to understand that failing is okay. And, and you can get up from that. And, and, and it's a lesson we take from games. Absolutely. Like, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. If you look at games, I think uh, the best games actually are the games where you fail more than you win. And, and <laughs> yeah, it's actually, you know, if you you know, if you think about it, dark souls. <laughs> yeah, it might be a bit crazy, but but even like you know, um, very popular mobile games, things like Angry Birds, for instance. There's far more failure than there is success. Uh, I mean, often you play levels four or five times to, before you uh, actually su- succeed in uh, in seeing it through all the way. And and that you know that frustration, you know, of failure, you know, failure can definitely be frustrating. But I think it's 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 absolutely necessary, and even you know, to some degree, of course. But the more frustration, the better the feeling of winning. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's always really important. It's it's something I, I I always look into also when when designing these training series for our clients to make sure that you know there are not walks in the park. You know, it it should be <laughs> difficult. You know, it should be frustrating. Uh, otherwise it's too easy and it's not fun you know you need yes. frustration and fun go hand in hand <laughs> yes yes difficulty frustration all those things are part of fun for sure you know like nicole lazaro with with hard fun <laughs> and those kinds yeah, of things I, exactly i completely agree and we, we talked about this this difficult challenge that you face and you know it didn't go well but i'm sure many other things have gone well so we would like to shift in, into a story like that one like something that you went for and it, it went well, you know, one of those maybe proud stories that you have that you would like to share with the audience? Ooh, that's also a good question. Yeah, I think I think many things we were doing went well. I mean, we've got some amazing clients. It's always, uh, you know, for me, it's actually always difficult to, let's say, stand still and be, you know, uh, celebrate whatever we achieve, whatever I achieve. You know, I, I always keep on going. Absolutely. And I always forget. So I always keep on going and just, you know, go on, forget, forget celebrating. But, you know, e- eventually I'm also very proud of where I've uh, come this far. So also as an entrepreneur, you know, doing this business, doing this startup, you know, eventually it's it's all choices combined led to, you know, let's say this moment. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to truly help people in learning and therefore applying, you know, new skills to improve their lives. And, and, you know, that, that really is what gets me going. That sounds fantastic. And is, is there, is there any, I don't know, maybe there's a time of, of a, I don't know, a project or even the startup itself that you remember, you know, one of those tough moments and you actually were able to pull through because maybe we, we can take a few lessons of, of the success that you had. That, that would be pretty interesting as well. There's one very cool anecdote I think I could share about, um, about a client and a project we did. And it had to do with a bank robbery. So we did this for, for uh, you know, obviously a financial institution. And we we filmed a bank robbery and we did a training scenario. We made a VR training scenario for, for a bank robbery. And one of the employees of that bank uh, was playing that training scenario. And he actually got into a robbery situation, I think, two or three weeks after playing that VR training scenario. And in the training, you know, you learn how to respond, you know, when such a thing happens. You know, it's obviously quite an emotional event. You know, you, you, you can't prepare for such an event, but you never know how you truly react, you know, when something like that happens. And he actually told us afterwards, or at least that's what we've heard from the client, that he was more calm and more relaxed because he did the VR training. So I was very proud there that we, you know, together with the client created that training scenario and it, and that there was, you know, true real evidence of an employee who we affected, you know, his life and made sure that, that he was more relaxed in, uh, and, and safer because he was more relaxed for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. V- VR and, and in general simulations, I think they have their way of, of helping you experience something so that when it happens again, like when you experience something many times, the next time if it happens in real life, there are better chances of you, you know, not reacting so emotionally as you would because it kind of could start forming part of your of your experience, so to speak, even if it wasn't real. And and I'm I'm, I'm guessing that VR has a lot to do with that. 
Absolutely. I think, you know, it, VR can get really close to the emotion, you know, which you, you would probably feel when such an event would occur. You know, and if you can attach, let's say, already on forehand, you know, those procedures with that specific emotion, I believe it's easier to, you know, recognize that situation if it happens in real life and you know what to do because you've, you've been there before. You've been very close to that real life situation. So you know what to do. So your reflex are, are already there, yeah. ready to, to, to react in that sense. And yeah. Thais, you've, you've mentioned, again, you've, you've done this for quite a while. You've had all these experiences. This one sounds like a fantastic one, the, the bank robbery. If When you are about to face a new project that involves you know, VR, as you're doing currently, and you know, of course, designing using maybe some game mechanics, maybe some gamification or not, how do you approach this? Like, do you have a series of steps, a process? How how do you how do you go about this when you're facing a client? Uh, yes, absolutely. We we uh, we definitely have a process, and I think so. Also, you know, in this business, but also in all the um, the projects I did did before this startup, if you design games, um, well, specifically serious games, or which is a bit of a, a strange term, but applied games or gamification <laughs> solutions. Let's say normally when you when you would design games specifically, let's say for entertainment purposes, obviously you can learn a lot from them. Uh, but the main goal would be to you know have entertain people to to make sure that they have a good time. Uh, I think that there, there's the only difference when you are designing game based solutions or you know really applied games is that you know eventually the learning goal. So what is it? You know, in our case, it's a learning goal. What is it that employees really need to learn? That actually comes first, so that's always a starting point for us. But directly afterwards, we actually design the game goal. So for us, the learning goal and the game goal are two different things. So the learning goal would be, you know, what have you learned after taking off the VR headset in this case? But the game goal is what happens in the game? What happens in a scenario? What's the goal in the scenario? And especially that one can be very, very strong. So what we always do, we work with a lot of narrative and narrative can be connected to a game goal very well. You know, you can put people into a certain situation, make sure it feels very real, and then give them an assignment to do, you know, which eventually is that game goal. So for us, that that process of figuring out what's the learning goal, what do people need to learn, but then what's the narrative that, that's, you know, far off. And I think a very uh, important game mechanic and I think actually one that is too often overlooked in applied games, we come up with that narrative and that game goal. And from that moment on, we are trying to really look for, you know, what are interesting dilemmas we can give to the player? Like at what points in that narrative and that storyline can it get pretty difficult for the player to make choices? And, and the more difficult it gets for that player to make choices, the more interesting the scenario is. Yeah, interesting, relevant choices. That that's super important in, in games because when if the option, the right option is always too obvious, then it's not really a choice, right? Absolutely. Yeah. No, uh, true. So so it should be it should have the right level of difficulty indeed. Makes sense. Makes sense. Just a quick break before we continue with this episode. If you've been enjoying this podcast, I would really appreciate if you share it with your friends and family and on social media. On Twitter, and Instagram, it's at Rob Alvarez B and the hashtag Professor Game, all one word. And in Facebook, you can find the Professor Game page. Thanks in advance for your engagement. And Thais, you know, you again with all this this experience with the the projects that you worked on, you probably have come you know come through with many different ways of doing things. And would you say that there is some sort of I don't know? best practice or something that you say, well, when you're approaching a project that involves games, uh, you probably should be thinking about these things and that would benefit the project as a whole. Not no silver bullet, but, you know, something that in general helps, you know, make projects a little bit better. I don't know. I, you know, eventually I think yeah, that's, this might be a bit of a strange thing with designing games is that in, in a certain way, I, I believe that everyone is actually a game designer. I can remember I did, I did a lot of workshops uh, back in the days for uh, educators of, of primary and secondary uh, educational institutions. And during these workshops, I always try to gamify the material they would use in their classrooms, you know, for, for the students. And, and every single one told 
me, you know, I'm not a game designer. I cannot gamify, you know, my math lesson. And I was always like, okay, I'm going to teach you. And in two hours from now, you've designed a game and it's actually a good game. Hmm. And that always worked because, you know, people can think in terms of games somehow. And the main point I always gave them is to think about games they already know. And every single person knows a game or has a favorite game. It could be a card game, it could be a board game, it could be a video game. Uh, but everybody knows some sort of a game they've played and enjoyed playing that game. And then I ask people, you know, what's your favorite game? And they would tell me, oh, well, I don't have a favorite game. I only do uh, Sudokus in the local newspaper. And I'm like, oh, there you go. That's your favorite game. And using that as a starting point can be very valuable for, you know, at least getting that brainstorm going on, you know, what can we do as a game-based solution for this challenge? So I think there, you know, it's, it's, it's quite easy to come up with a game concept. But I think it's very hard to really master, you know, game design, let's say, in order to make really good games. I mean, that costs a tremendous amount of time and a lot of playtesting in order to get it really right. Makes sense. So <laughs> that best practice is thinking of yourself as a, as, a, as a game designer and, you know, trying and failing, I guess, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I, yeah, also there, you know, a lot of failing indeed, but quick failing. So feel yeah. fast trying to design something, you know, think of, of any game you already know, make sure that it fits the challenge you currently have, directly build it on paper. It can be as simple as you can, you know, as, as, as possible. And, and play test, you know. It's, you, can, you can already, after 30 minutes or so, you, you can put something on paper and play test and then use that to go into the next design phase, let's say, and uh, improve. Yes, absolutely. Let's do that. <laughs> Sounds very exciting. And and Tice, you've gone through a good part of the interview by now. I don't know if somebody comes to your head and say, oh, this, this person, I, I would really like to listen to this person in the podcast. So it's kind of a suggestion for a future guest or maybe a past guest as well. Um, does anybody come to your mind when I say this? Absolutely. One of the uh, companies I've worked as a gamification consultant was uh, Woo Sports. And, and Woo Sports is a startup. Well, it was back in the days, it was a startup. So They're already in business for a couple of years. And uh, what they have is they sell a small sensor and it's being used for kite boarding. So, you know, with kite on and with a board and a a big kite, you go out on the sea, you do all kinds of tricks. Uh, And that sensor would actually measure what you were doing, you know, how high you were jumping, the amount of airtime, etc. So there's a lot of variables there to create a really cool gamified, you know, solution it's 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 kind of real life gaming it's like uh you know strava but then for kiteboarding hmm. uh so i i did some work for them um, in the beginning when they were setting up their business and the founder of of Woo sports he's called leo kunig is a, is a guy from germany uh, i think he would be very interested in in talking to you and uh, i would be very interested in in hearing him in this podcast Interesting. Sounds like a very, very good suggestion. I had never heard of this this company or this founder either. It sounds like a very interesting guest to have in the future as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. It's a very cool company. And keeping up with the recommendations, Dice, if you had to recommend just one book, what book would you recommend to the engagers, the, this audience, and why? Mm, just one book? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are so many. Uh, let, let me recommend uh, the book I'm currently reading. I think that would be good. Sure. It's a book uh, written by the founder of Patagonia, the clothing brand. Yep. Uh, the book is called Let My People Go Surfing. Well, I surf as well. That's mainly <laughs> why I was attracted to that book. But uh, the whole, let's say, philosophy of you know that Patagonia founder is really, truly great. So he really sees working as part of life. So for him, there's no work and then play and then you know being at home so it's all combined and you have to make sure you make the best out of you know let's say every hour you have so working should be fun so he really sets up his business in such a way that you know every single employee can maximize you know what he or she is good at uh, but also make sure that there's a lot of fun in working and when there's no time for working for instance because there are very good waves out there uh, everybody, you know, can can uh, close their uh, computer and just go out there and go into the sea to go surfing. So, kind of the whole atmosphere, the whole lifestyle—that that's something I truly love. And uh, 
Yeah, I think there's somehow there's a connection with games as well. You know, make, making sure it's fun, uh, it, it, hard fun. You know, it should work, but there should also be time for for fun. Makes so sense. I really love that book. Absolutely, sounds pretty pretty interesting. I've, I've I haven't even heard of the book. I've heard of the brand for sure. In fact, I use uh, some references of, of that brand for some of my classes on supply chain. So <laughs> I definitely definitely heard of them, but I hadn't heard of the book. So it sounds interesting. It's a really interesting book. Yeah. And, you know, we've, you've recommended other people, you know, the, the other guests, books. But in your case, what would you say is your superpower, that sweet spot, that thing that you do at least better than most other people? I think I'm, I'm let's say, more of a generalist than a specialist. So I think my superpower would be that in a, you know, design process of, of creating a game, very early on, I could get a very good idea on you know, how the game is going to be like, so how it's going to work, if it's going to be good or not. You know, I, I would say I've got a good overview of all the different elements, so all the different game mechanics, but also kind of the narrative, the design, but also the feasibility of what we're creating. You know, is it, is it too big? Is it going to work? Is it, you know, is it scalable? Can it be played by many? Uh, so, so I think I'm really good at that, you know, making sure that, early in the process, uh, we can already figure out, you know, whether it's going to work or not. Sure. That is absolutely a superpower. Some people might have something similar to that and it doesn't have to be absolutely unique, but it does sound like very, very useful, especially for the space. Yeah. And Thijs, now comes probably one of the most difficult questions and it has to do with what is your favorite game? Oh, that is a difficult question. Well, let me mention at least one VR game. You know, obviously, I'm doing a lot of <laughs> VR, uh, which is, you know, maybe the, the most well-known VR game, but that's probably because it's really good, uh, which is Beat Saber. I really love, you know, after a hard day's work, put on my Oculus Quest 2 and then play some Beat Saber at home. <laughs> you know, eventually, that's, that's you know, it's, it's a good workout, let's say. Uh, you can really get into that game. So I, I truly love that. Uh, but I think eventually the, the, the games I love most, most are kind of the puzzle adventures. So things, you know, the Room game series on smartphone, those games I, I really love. So there are a couple of games they made all called The Room, where you are kind of in a, in a 3D environment. You really have to solve all these puzzles. So it's kind of an escape game, escape room uh, kind of concept. I truly love those kind of games. You know, it's kind of a puzzle. You need to think, you need to solve uh, in order to to proceed. <laughs> interesting, interesting games, for sure. So, Thais, we're running out of time, but I don't want to let you go before you give us, you know, whatever final piece of advice you wanna you wanna throw in. And of course, let us know where we can find you. How can we connect with you? Where can we know more about you about Warp VR? Like, this is sort of the plug zone, if if, if you wanna call it that way. Yeah, I think. You know, if you want to get into the space, let's say, or of, of games or game-based solutions, gamified solutions, I think a good starting point is always to start from a game you know. So, you know, use Scrabble, uh, Sudoku already mentioned, maybe Mario Kart, you know, maybe Beat Saber. Think of those games in order to start working on, on a certain challenge you have. Uh, so maybe within your company, you're thinking, okay, I want to use games or gamified solutions in order to, I don't know, motivate employees or, or making sure that people are doing some sort of a procedure. It's always a good starting point to start from games you already know and work from there. So I think that would be quick advice, let's say, for, for listeners who really want to get into uh, game-based solutions. Great. And where can we find out more about Ties and Warp VR? Yeah, you can connect with me uh, on LinkedIn, for instance, just uh, search for my name. Definitely also on Twitter, uh, Thijs de Vries as a, as a handle. I love to talk to everyone uh, regarding uh, games, game-based solutions, uh, also VR or VR training. And if you're interested indeed in my company, Warp VR, and what we're doing, uh, please go to warpvr.com. Pretty straightforward. Makes sense. And if you don't know how to spell Thai's name, I, I can completely feel your, your difficulty. If you're not for, if you're not, not Dutch, you probably have a hard time on that. You will find it on professorgame.com. You'll just look for Thais. So T-H-J-I-S. Is that correct? It's T-H-I-J-S. 
T H I J S. <laughs> there you go. I'm already making the first the first mistake. But there there you can just search for that and you'll find all the links to, you know, Twitter, to LinkedIn, everything else. Or you can just directly go into that social media and find Tice right there. And Tice, thank you very much for investing this time. I know it's you know it's a late night at home for you as well. So thank you very much for taking this time, this opportunity to, you know, to talk to the engagers, to give your your knowledge, your insights. However, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Hey, Engagers, thank you for listening to Professor Game Podcast, and I hope you enjoyed this interview with Tice. And, you know, if you have any kinds of questions that you would like to ask other guests, future guests, all you have to do is go to professorgame.com slash question and ask your question. If it is selected and you have pretty good chances, it will come up in a future episode and you will get your answer live in an episode. And remember, before you go on to your next mission, before you click continue, remember to subscribe using your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.